Welcome, and thank you for joining our session on navigating the highs and lows of clinical trials with cannabis. My name is Beatrice Setnick, and I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at Alta Sciences. The objectives for today is to understand how clinical trial data can support your cannabis products, clinical trial methods to evaluate the safety, exposure, and effects of your cannabis formulation will be covered. We'll also discuss how drug administration, dosing, and selection of study subjects is handled, and some regulatory considerations when conducting clinical research in cannabis in the United States and Canada. To give a very quick definition of cannabis, the most actively grown species are sativa and indica. There are hundreds of active components in cannabis uh, beyond THC and cannabidiol, which are the main ones, but there are various phytocannabinoids and terpenes. And uh, although sativa strains have been thought to be high in THC and indica strains high in CBD, uh, modern analysis reveals sometimes that that's not always the case, but uh, oftentimes it is. To give a general overview of the endocannabinoid system, it com is composed of various receptors, primarily CB1 and CB2. These are receptors for CB1 that are found primarily in the brain and central nervous system, and to a lesser extent in the periphery, whereas CB2 receptors are mostly in the peripheral organs, especially cells associated with the immune system. As you can see from the keys here, THC, cannabidiol, and cannabinol bind to such receptors to exert their effects. We should also note that there are both endogenous, which means that these are chemicals that are found within the body that bind to the receptors, as well as exogenous ligands, meaning things that come from outside of the living system that bind to these receptors and exert an effect in our bodies. There are various effects of cannabis that are noted, and most of these are centrally mediated effects which include feelings of relaxation, euphoria, awareness of sensation, libido. We know that it has a, it, the impact on things like appetite. Uh, there can be auditory or visual hallucinations associated with cannabis, uh, as well as altered body image and depersonalization. So it has a variety of centrally mediated effects. The cannabis and the potential medical uses have been known throughout history, and various medical uses have been reported for cannabis, which includes pain, nausea, insomnia, anxiety, inflammation, glaucoma, muscle spasm, and PTSD, to name a few. Some of these have been recognized as indications for which cannabis-type compounds have been approved for medical use. The Established medical indications, there are formulations that are approved both in Health Canada, by Health Canada and the US FDA, and those include the recently approved Epidiolex cannabidiol, which is indicated for the treatment of seizures with particular types of seizures in uh, pediatrics and adults. There are also dronabinol, which is a synthetic Delta 9-THC, for example, Marinol and Syndros, which is primarily indicated for the anorexia associated with weight loss in patients with AIDS, as well as nausea and vomiting during cancer chemotherapy. There are also other synthetic molecules, such as Nabilone, which is Sesamet, indicated again for nausea and vomiting, as well as Sativex, which is a combination of THC and cannabidiol, and that is specifically targeted for the symptomatic relief of spasticity in adults that have multiple sclerosis. So taking into account drug pathways and pathways for drug development, one has to ask, is it a drug or is it a botanical? A botanical is a product that's derived from a plant material, whereas a drug is synthetic, or it can also be derived from a plant material if it's deemed um, a highly purified substances. So there can be nuances between the definitions. In terms of the clinical studies, the two pathways don't necessarily differ. And in early phase clinical studies, the evaluation of whether you're dealing with a botanical or a synthetic or a highly purified drugs are very similar. Uh, they are targeting the evaluation of safety and efficacy in the given condition that you're targeting. The clinical pharmacology of cannabis, uh, there are data requirements that are determined by the FDA, Health Canada, and ICH. 
Uh, so the Health Canada and FDA allow sponsors to refer to published data on drugs. And as you know, there's an abundance of literature on the evaluation of cannabis, and that becomes an integral component in supporting a drug application. Uh, any types of previous decisions about safety or efficacy are also considered in these types of applications. Data can be referenced uh, on the same drug or a scientific justification for similarity. So, for example, you're synthesizing a synthetic THC, um, you, one may have a justification for referring to literature with the uh, botanically derived THC. Establishing similarity is a simple process for single molecules. It's more complicated for botanicals because, as we've mentioned from the onset, botanicals have not only one active component, but they have multiple uh, active. They have uh, several hundred, can have several hundreds of different chemicals in their material that can contribute to different effects. So for clinical trials, when we're evaluating any kind of, whether it be a botanical or a drug or a synthetic, the clinical drug trials evaluate the safety, the efficacy, the absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, so what the body is doing to the drug, the dosing and frequency, it evaluates risk versus benefits, and it also, most importantly, also includes contraindications. So is the drug contraindicated uh, with certain vulnerable patients, or is it dangerous or poses risk if it's combined with other drugs? The phases of clinical development are essentially partitioned into four phases. Phase one are small trials that evaluate drug metabolism and safety. Phase two are medium-sized trials in patients that evaluate the proof of concept and safety in the target patient population. Phase three studies are large studies that demonstrate that the drug is actually effective in the target pop patient population for which the in label indication is, is gearing towards. And phase four studies are studies that are conducted post-marketing to examine further safety, effectiveness, and other endpoints of interest. The different types of pharmacology studies evaluate various different areas. So for example, safety, tolerability, and pharmacokinetics are something that one should consider for both recreational or non-targeted medical use. Uh, so there are certain studies that are required for a full drug development program, whereas there are studies that are also within this subset that are important for drugs and THC and botanicals that are not necessarily going down a traditional drug development path, but are being intended for a recreational or wider spread use market. When you're bringing something towards for a recreational or general use market, one also needs to establish that the product is safe. Um, it's safe when it's combusted or vaped. And uh, there are also types of focus group studies that can look at product evaluation and pre preference, for example, taste, textures, smokeability, irritation, and all other aspects in which we can assure that a new product is safe for a generalized market. Some study design considerations. When you're looking at evaluating cannabis in the clinic, the reference product, what needs to identify an appropriate comparator for which you're comparing against, the dosing needs to be safe. Uh, you need to safely select appropriate doses. In some cases, there may need to be dose titrations if the subjects are not used to cannabis and need to have a dose that's carefully escalated to a target dose. The route of administration, whether it's vaped, smoked, oral needs to be considered. And as you see on the right-hand side, when you do have products that are smoked or vaped in a clinical study, one does need to have controlled smoking chambers that will allow airflow and circulation and also limit the exposure to staff as well. So there needs to be very uh, careful considerations around how that's administered in a clinical setting. The study population, for example, rec recreational cannabis users are often selected for these types of studies because they have experience with the products, they have a degree of tolerability, and they also have experience with a lot of routes of administration that a, a healthy uh, night cannabis naive user may not necessarily have. Uh, and then we look at various 
different uh, endpoints in these types of studies. So for example, the safety of combustibles, we'll look at biomarkers of exposure, biomarkers of potential harm, what can be happening when the drug is ingested or inhaled. Now we'll take a look at some regulatory considerations. So marijuana, as I mentioned earlier, is a schedule, continues to be a Schedule One compound in the United States because it is it does not have a federally accepted medical use. Whereas, as I've shown, examples of Sesamet, Syndros, and Marinol and Epidiolex have all become lesser scheduled because they have an approved medical use and they are they do have some degree of abuse potential epidiolex uh, is one of the lowest ones on the scheduling system um, but these are referred to as accepted medical use drugs and therefore have a differential schedule from marijuana which is sits in class in, in schedule one the differential scheduling of syndros adrenabinol uh, which was approved in 2016 as a Schedule II compound is an interesting one. This one was a formulated as an oral solution, five milligrams per ml. It has a conservative scheduling due to the formulation. Syndros comes in a oral solution. Its formulation contains alcohol, and because of the large content of the in the in the product, there's 150 milligrams in the 30 ml solution, with about half of that being alcohol. The FDA uh, and regulators, and, some, and because of some of the study data that showed that there were more psychiatric events with syndromes, deemed it as a Schedule II compound, and that's in contrast uh, to other the other drugs that have um, Marinol, which is a Schedule III, and that was largely moved from Schedule II to Schedule III for patient accessibility. So sometimes here's an example of how a formulation can have an impact on the abuse potential and therefore the scheduling of a product. The human abuse potential study evaluates the likability of a drug in a face valid population. And these are sort of the pivotal studies that position drugs into the respective scheduling class based on their abuse potential profile. These are single dose, double blind crossover studies conducted in non-dependent recreational drug users. In these types of studies, both a placebo and an active control is used. And an active control is a drug with known abuse potential. So for example, it's cannabis. And a pharmacological challenge is used to ensure that the subjects are in fact non-dependent on the recreational drug and they're sensitive to the active control. Here is an example of abuse potential data measured on drug liking. So the question that asks, how much do you like the drug? For cannabidiol, which was the Epidiolex, and this was compared to dronabinol, which is, uh, which we talked about earlier as a synthetic THC, and alprazolam, as well as placebo. And as you can see from this graph, the CBD here indicated in the blue, the black line, as well as in the light blue, have a very low uh, drug liking score, very similar to placebo, which is in the orange, meaning that they don't feel much of an effect in terms of likability. Uh, when you look at dronabinol here in the red and purple, there's a dose effect here uh, that's showing higher drug liking, as well as alprazolam, another drug with known abuse potential. And so you can see that there is a quite uh, a flat line for the cannabidiol, uh, and this doesn't produce the effect that a THC-type compound would. And as a result of this human abuse potential study that I showed, the data from which uh, the Epidiolex received a Schedule 5, which is the lowest uh, schedule on the Controlled Substances Act. And in that uh, abuse section 9.2 of their product label, there is a descriptor of the human abuse potential data that I just showed you on the previous graph. The drug labeling, so when you go into a traditional NDS or an NDA, a traditional drug development pathway, your product label will have inherent claims about what the medication can do based on the data that you've collected. When you're targeting a recreational or a medical, uh, generalized medical population, the labeling will be very limited because you don't have the, the labeling claims and the data to support certain labeling claims. And it's quite restrictive. It will have appropriate warnings and um, it does not have specific medical claims. 
And more importantly, it also doesn't have specific dosing instructions, which becomes problematic. It becomes problematic to physicians. It becomes problematic to patients who are taking a off-the-shelf product for medical reasons and don't have the clarity in how they're supposed to use the product, which is why having some clinical trials and some evaluations for your products become very important so that you can guide the consumers and the physicians on how to prescribe your product. So generally conducting clinical research with cannabis, there are some regulatory considerations and hurdles to think about. Uh, in the US, it requires a Schedule One license to be able to conduct research with a cannabis, a Schedule One product. Performing interstate commerce on non-approved or non-exempted cannabis products is still illegal in the United States. Therefore, the movement of products across state lines can also be illegal. And there are no currently issued uh, exemptions for cannabis containing products by the FDA. Um, the cannabis products used in trials are currently restricted to NIH products, produced products. Um, so you have a very limited insight to the, the quality, the, the composition of the plant, um, and a producer can apply to the DEA to be added to the list, but you're very restricted in terms of what your comparators can be in the U.S. when it comes to cannabis. In Canada, the, the regulations are more loose there because of the federal legalization of cannabis, which took place in 2018. Cannabis in Canada can be moved without issue, prior, provided that all parties have appropriate licenses, so we can move across provincial lines. Uh, the cannabis products coming from outside Canada require an import-export license, and we assume about eight weeks for this particular step. The clinical trial applications is not governed by can the Cannabis or Narcotics Act. This is still under the Office of Clinical Trials, and therefore, you're being treated as a drug development pathway when you're going in to do clinical trials. And this will require, the CTA is required for any study that's involving humans that looks at any potential health claim, pharmacodynamic, pharmacokinetic, regardless of the product, unless specifically exempted for these regulations, which cannabis is not. So the current challenge is addressing the good production practices required for marketing versus good manufacturing practices required for clinical trials also has to be addressed um, because it is required that a CTA application is included with a drug that is manufactured under good manufacturing practices. And that can also be a disconnect with, depending on how the product is being manufactured. So there are some considerations, uh, but certainly the importation, exportation, and the start of the studies are far uh, a bit more simplified due to the federal legalization in Canada. So in summary, the legalization of cannabinoids in the U.S. and Canada has increased, and it will continue to evolve further in the United States. Requirements for testing continue to evolve. It's apparent that even if you're producing a drug for a recreational market, safety is always an important consideration. Uh, if you're targeting a medical uh, indication or if you're targeting a medical recipient, even without a formal drug application, understanding the safety and the dosing is critical and oftentimes lacking from, from the labels and from guidance that's given to physicians and to patients. Formulations can impact drug scheduling. Uh, so when you're creating formulations and you're creating it down a traditional drug pathway, you need to be mindful about how your formulation may affect its abuse potential and how to mitigate that. Uh, claims for therapeutic indications require traditional drug development pathways, and those are more involved and will require a further, uh, enhanced, further inclusion of clinical trials to support the safety and the efficacy of the product. So the important consideration is that there is a need for data-driven differentiation for products. There is a need for information on safety and appropriate use and dosing, and very importantly, there, things like strategic clinical trials and focus group studies can help delineate, differentiate a product, but also determine its safety, its appropriate use, the perception to the consumer, and the effectiveness of the product for the condition that it's being targeted at. So I'd like to thank you for your attention, and we'll go to any questions you may have.